Recording is on. All right. Welcome to Papers We Love Seattle. Uh, we are going to be talking today about a, a fresh new paper right off the block. Um, it, it came out in in late January. This year is just presented at the New Ideas and Emerging Results uh, Conference at uh, ICSE uh, 2022 in Pittsburgh. Um, and the, the paper is called Grammars for Free uh, Towards Grammar Inference for Ad Hoc Parsers. And uh, let me share my screen and we can see what I'm talking about. So, so this is uh, the talk. Uh, th these are the actual uh, slides that were presented by uh, Michael and Jurgen at, uh, at, at the conference. Uh, they also have a, a great uh, YouTube video of the talk that is, is definitely worth going through. And they, they, uh, uh, Michael explains it uh, way better than I'm going to. Um, but what drew me to this paper was, uh, first off, I, I, I love uh, programming language theory and, and the idea he's got, uh, and the idea of, um, uh, uh, you know, type inference. And I, I saw these words, I'm like, oh, grammar inference, what's that? Ad hoc parsers, what are any of these things meant? So I was able to, uh, you know, one of the things about this is we were, we were able to learn about it, right? So first off, you have to define what an ad hoc parser is or uh, what parser is. Parser is like anything that parses something else, like uh, like uh, a string parser. Right? In, in its very simplest form, it's things that you see on the screen here. Split is a parser. And the, they define it as an ad hoc parser because it is a, a parser that we, for lack of a better term, use in code flippantly. We don't, we don't really think of it as, as something uh, rigidly defined, you know, match, test, uh, split, find. Anytime uh, you, uh, God forbid, put a, uh, a regular expression in your code, don't do that. Um, you know, uh, that, that is a, a, posh, a parser. And it's ad hoc because it is not a rigidly defined parser. It's a parser that is inside uh, your code somewhere. And they're everywhere. They're, they're all over our code. Like, this is like we all do this, right? And so this is a very uh, simple example of a parser, um, of an ad hoc parser. Uh, in in this, uh, in, I, I believe this is in in Python, where uh, where we're we're taking a string, and we're splitting that string uh, by commas, and then mapping that to ints to do one, two, three. So. The, this is a an ad hoc parser that takes a string, splits it by commas, turns it into an array of integers. That's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, but what's the grammar of this? What's the grammar behind this? Like, mean what are all the inputs and possible outputs for this thing? You know, for this it looks pretty straightforward. But what if you put a an empty string? LOL. If you put an empty string, this thing errors out. So you can't do that. But nowhere here is it well defined and obvious that this happens. So this is something that is a pretty common mistake. That, like that, this is, you know, a, a common thing that can happen. It's undefined. Um, how about this? Uh, plus zero one underscore two comma three underscore four underscore or three underscore zero underscore four space. This actually parses for some insane reason uh and it works it works this totally works now this uh goes to a, an array of 12 and 304 great um but uh again uh this is something that like you're probably not writing this test okay you know you're, you're writing this code this is probably not in your test set um uh and you know you can probably go through and and read about map and 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 read through all the documentation of map, read through all the documentation of split, and be like, okay, okay, I now know everything because I've read all the documentation. Maybe I've cracked open the the source code of, of C Python to really understand exactly what what it is. And now I can write all these test cases. You won't, but you could. Uh, and and that's really what uh, and 
at hospital. Really? Eric, that's fascinating. Eric just said that underscores allow people to group digits for easier reading. That's fascinating. Wow. It's the day I learned. <laughs> um, but again, like stuff like that, like I didn't know that before, literally right now, right? Um, all, all I looked at, all I said, saw was this is weird, um, but it works, right? Uh, so, but, but good news because we've read all of that documentation, we can actually define a, a strict grammar for this, uh, map split thing, right? We can say, this is, this is the, a uh, formal grammar, uh, uh, and if you map that formal grammar into uh, a railroad diagram, I these are called railroad diagrams, right? Um, then, uh, then you can see very clearly what can and cannot be inputted here, right? Uh, this is very useful. This is this this looks great. I would love to have this. Unfortunately, like like going through this exercise for all of the ad hoc parsers you have all over your code is a big pain in the butt and you're not going to do it because that is very tiring right uh so doing this by hand uh is it's just you're not going to do it right um uh and but wouldn't it be neat if if we could do it uh and we could do it automatically through inference right um so like what would be the value of grammars what what's what what really uh get what value would they add i think we talked I, I mentioned a couple right but here's a bunch more right uh the like if you had your grammars well defined you'd have some really great documentation on uh what your programs could and could not do right um uh though i love railroad diagrams i think they're amazing they're they're really easy to understand if you had those, you can be like, oh, I, I can see what, what what input could work and what input wouldn't work, what input would, and what input would break things. Uh, they could be used for fuzzing. Uh, we had a talk years ago where we went into details about fuzzing and how fuzzing works. But if you knew like the the all possible inputs for uh, a chunk of code, then uh, then you could write a fuzzer that could exercise all those possible inputs. Really powerful, right? Uh, automatic random testing, pretty cool. And then I didn't dig into this yet, but it seems really interesting. I guess there's an entire world of uh, language security folks, langsec.org, that um, uh, are trying to make uh, languages safer. Or, or, or and they they found that a lot, like a lot of language vulnerabilities and and problems in uh, programs are a result of ad hoc parsers uh, doing unintentional things, right? Or being able to accept things that that the original intent was not to accept them, which intuitively makes sense, right? Like, you know, just imagine that time you wrote a, uh, you put a regex in your code uh, and you thought it would do one thing, but it does that one thing and nine other things that you didn't even realize, right? Um, so so these ad hoc parsers are can be really problematic uh if not well defined uh, and as we saw like creating that grammar by hand is is not easy it's not going to be fun to do right um but uh th this is this is the analogy that i think is really interesting in in the paper is that uh they they related uh parsers to grammars as functions to types so functions like types bring out uh um some real power in in functional well any type of programming i would argue but you know uh ha having types uh is is a is a way to uh to really focus how uh how functions and constrain uh, uh what can be uh, what what functions can do and grammars, if if we could have those grammars defined, could do the exact same thing for parsers. So uh, just like types are a powerful tool for functions, grammars can be a powerful tool for parsers. But again, like 
a type a type is pretty straightforward. Uh, you call it a, you call it a string. Even you know when you get into more complex things like dependent types, it's relatively straightforward. Whereas a grammar, like look at this thing, you're not going to write this out uh, as a uh, as a precursor to to this statement, right? That's that's really complex. But way back when, uh, uh, old Robin Milner figured out how to do type inference, right? Um, which we should do that paper sometime because that's a pretty cool paper. Like we figured out, um, and many languages, uh, Python included here, has type inference. It says, ah, okay, you're doing dots split on this. This, this S is probably a string. I'm going to treat this like a string. Uh, and you're mapping whatever this is to an int. I know that maps create arrays, and they and this is going to be an array of int. So ah, I can infer that this is an array of integers. And the way this is done is, is really cool. Jurgen, thank you again for, for being here. Really appreciate uh, you. Really appreciate your work on the paper. Um, take care. Um, and uh, and and so so type inference has a lot of value. Uh, it's a lot of value because uh, now instead of like typing out the well the 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 two extremes are you have no types. That's not a th and you're in this purely dynamic programming language, and then you have to do a lot of frustrating things when when there's when there's no types, right? Um, uh, you have to test a bunch of things because you can anything can be anything. Uh, there are a lot of languages out there like that. Um, uh, on the other extreme, you have very strict types that all have to be written out by hand, right? Um, and that's also mildly annoying. But ever since the mention of good type inference comes along, um, you don't have to do that. That's great. What if, what if you can do the exact same thing with grammars? grammar inference so you could write this out and uh you know we we know that this by type inference we know that this s is going to be a string but what if we could have grammar inference saying ah if you're doing uh this thing which i know is a string i'm going to split on it i'm going to split by this string that's a comma i know now i can infer this grammar based on uh, on on what this is, if we can do this, and like like Jurgen said a little bit earlier, uh, this is this is a vision paper. So they're in the middle of working out the mathematics to to make this a reality. They haven't cracked the puzzle yet, um, but they're they're working on it. Um, but if we can get there, where we can get to the point of being able to infer grammar, we can do some really nifty things so so let's imagine for a second that that we can infer grammar um uh what will what 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 what, what, what can we get if we infer grammar right so the, i had to look this up i didn't know what the chomsky hierarchy was um if if, if you did point points uh to you but let me uh, uh let me put this in here uh it, it's worth it's worth a read. Um, so the Chomsky hierarchy. Um, uh, like Noam, Ch uh, 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 Noam Chomsky, that Chomsky, the the uh, uh, the famous guy from uh, from uh, the famous linguist, uh, came up with this definition of languages, right? And uh, Languages can be defined rigidly uh, here, uh, but you know what he what said is uh, we usually define uh, languages uh, by the grammar of the language itself, uh, and a language can also be defined by a machine that uh, that speaks that language. So this machine can uh, can encompass and define a language. Um, so one of the things uh, uh, in the Chomsky hierarchy of languages, uh, there are recursively enumerable, that, that is the most broad language there is. Um, that's like English or, or a full programming language. 
a recursively enumerable language is uh, like all of this. This recursively enumerable languages uh, are Turing complete, which means you can do anything in them. That is very problematic. You can't define a grammar on a, a recursively enumerable language. It's too broad because the the language has, can theoretically have any input and have any output. But is, uh, so if, if you tried to define the grammar on all of this, it, it's just too, it's too inclusive. It's too inclusive, right? Uh, but within this language, which is just a Python program, if you pick out subsets uh, of the language, uh, you, they can be constrained into a tighter type of, uh, of machine, a tighter type of language. A regular language. Uh, this is where regular expressions come from. Like the word regular. It's a regular language. It's defined in this Chomsky hierarchy. Um, these things, these regular uh, uh, languages, ah, that's something that we theorize that, that uh, Michael and Jurgen theorize can be uh, uh, inferred through a grammar. So these parsers are like little embedded machines in the overall machine of your program, right? So here's two. There's one that does a split, just like we talked about earlier. Here's another one that maps. This is very. This is doing the exact same thing we were doing before, right? But these are are little tiny machines inside a machine, and so this is how they talk about uh, figuring out how we could do automatic grammar uh, in inference, right? So we we take let's just look at um, at this we're going to um, for the, the first thing we need to do is have rigid definitions of what some of these things do like split we have to have a rigid definition of what the split function in Python does and this is a mathematical definition of what split does uh, and again uh, we have to have a rigid definition of what map does and uh, and you can see that right here, right? You know, like the, or, or actually this is the original definition of what integer is, right? In, so you have to have these, these mathematical spe specifications for each of these things. That's kind of your building blocks, right? And from there they go and they have this, uh, intermediate representation. It's sort of like, uh, a, a, a grammar assembly, right? So they break down that turn it into something a little bit simpler. And uh, then they use something called a refinement type system. Also something I didn't know about, um, uh, which is interesting. And here I, I have a link uh, to refinement type systems that you should check out as well to learn a little bit more. It's basically a concept of, of taking a type system and breaking it down into smaller subtype systems to be able to build it back up to to create something that looks like a type so they're they're trying to use this concept of of re refinement types to to break down uh this intermediate representation of the of their program uh in this case uh you know the splits and and mapping to ints uh and from from that refinement type system that they've defined they can then map that into a state machine. And once you have a state machine, state machine is the same thing as a grammar, same thing as uh, as one of these uh, uh, railroad diagrams and your goal. Now you have a grammar to define uh, your, your little um, uh, regular uh, languages inside your, your system. And this is what they theorize could, uh, if if we can get to this point, and that math they're trying to solve right now is really what the refinement type system uh, needs to be to uh, take this intermediate representation and for it into a into a real um, state machine. Because once they crack that code, uh, then we can have these grammars, and then you should be able to. This is the cool part. All of this is pretty cool, but uh, then you could then synthesize that back to the source code. Another thing I didn't understand until I, I watched her talk, I was like, what do you mean you can synthesize it? Uh, 
so they talk about it like what 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 kind of cool things can we do if we could actually crack this code and infer grammars well one thing that is you know the most straightforward is you could uh in your ide you could have uh interact documentation imagine scrolling over the definition of something and having this this grammar just pop up Boop. and and then let's say you make a change uh or you can highlight something and highlight it in your in your ide um uh and so then you you could have basically in just like you have implicit types you could have implicit grammars that could be really useful uh as documentation but once you have that you can also do other interesting things this is something they call program sketching so actually th this isn't as interesting as the next thing but yeah th th this is this is kind of neat so like you let's say you write out a program what they call program sketch which is like a a a part of a program right and then uh we again have this imagine inferred grammar this grammar exists uh and you look at this grammar and, and you're like oh man that's not the grammar i wanted this is this is absolutely not what i wanted to do so then you're like i actually want the grammar to look like this uh can you create a program that does that and then it would, it would go boop, 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 and take this grammar and spit out something, um, uh, a, a refined pro take, take the program you had before, refine it. So the grammar is correct. Um, this is interesting. I, I think what excites me a little bit less about this is that I don't know necessarily that me, a computer programmer will be like, oh, I look, you want to change this grammar and not, uh, uh instead of writing code, I would probably like, I would understand the code more than the grammar. You know what I mean? Uh, but it, it, it's, it, it's interesting that, you know, if you had this bi-directionalism, you could, you could synthesize code back and forth uh, based on the grammar. But I think what is more interesting to me uh, is, uh, oh, did I, did I skip one? No, um, there's one here. Ah, uh, yes, uh, I guess I got to it. Um, what what's more interesting to me is uh is is what this means for for basically finding bugs um so they one of the things they're they're toying with is is uh uh defining a grammar as an equivalence class over concrete implementations so concrete implementation in this case would be your code uh and grammar is an equivalence class or a uh, a an abstract definition of your code, sort of like a, a type system on top of your uh, uh, your code, right? And one of the things they say, like, hey, if you knew the grammar, you could you could do a search and and find. Uh, you're like, you know what? I just know this grammar. I I know it's somewhere in this code. Let me type it in and find it. Uh, again, I don't necessarily think I, a computer programmer would be like, yo, I need to find this grammar uh, and type it in. I, I don't think this is as valuable as this next thing. The next thing though, I think is super valuable. This was like eye-opening and amazing. Uh, imagine you're, uh, you're writing code and you change this I equals zero to I equals one. You can have your IDE or, or uh, uh, your stat code analysis tool pop up and be like, I don't know if you knew this, but if you change this from a zero to one, uh, the grammar goes from A star B to the the sum of A star B. Do you really want that? This is useful. This is really useful to me because then, because what this shows me as a programmer is like, oh my gosh, there's some unintended consequence that I wasn't even thinking of before. That sounds cool. This is really cool. Like this, this from from an everyday writing code software engineer point of view, this is where grammar inference shines. If they can crack the math of those uh, uh, of gain from that intermediate uh, type or intermediate language to uh, to the the true inference, this is what's going to 
save all of us software engineers a bunch of headache once we can get here. I then th this is the, the piece of the, the pie that really excites me. So like you're gonna mention earlier, this is a vision paper. Um, and that means you know, by the way, I just looked it up. Sigma is uh, any value. Oh, it's any value. Sigma so, is oh like a while. Sigma is a finite set of terminals disjoint from V where uh, which can make up the actual content of the sentence. The set of terminals the terminals is the alphabet of the language defined by the grammar G. Oh see. So it's like anything can occur before Baz parses anything which is sigma, any terminal, then A star B, because you're ignoring the first character. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just you, a clarification. That, that, I like it. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes more sense than why I said like I might I was looking at that. I'm like, how is this the sum of A star B? Uh, oh, oh, this that, that makes a lot more sense, Max. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's neat because you get you can see the difference. You know, I, things you might have not thought of before. Um, so, like I said, this is a vision paper. Uh, they're in the middle of working out the math. Um, so they're they're doing two things right now in their research over in Austria. Uh, they're doing a mining study of ad hoc parses in the wild. Uh, which means that they're like scouring um, uh, GitHub to find examples of ad hoc parsers in every language under the sun that you can see, think of. Um, and then they're doing, they're trying to crack the math, which is uh, this next part, the grammar inference via refinement types uh, for uh, parsing really simple uh, ad hoc parsers. Um, so they, that's the stuff that you're going to say is on the whiteboard right now. Um, and if they can crack that, when they crack that, um, the next step will be uh, a formal proof to prove the soundness of, of inference. Uh, I, I guarantee there'll be a paper on that. Uh, then uh, they want to do an evaluation of uh, all the ad hoc parsers they, they found in the wild, uh, then do an even larger mining study of the inferred grammars that they've discovered through uh, through their uh, grammar inference and then do a user study and grammar comprehension. So if they can crack the puzzle on grammar inference, there's a ton of research going I, I could see this fundamentally changing a lot of how we think about programming if they can crack this. It's very exciting. I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, that this can happen. Um, these are the guys, uh, Michael uh, Schroeder, uh, Jurgen uh, Sato, hopefully I pronounced that right, um, out of Vienna. Uh, they just uh, did this talk last week at the New Ideas and Emerging Results Conference at IC, uh, ICSE uh, 2022 in Pittsburgh. Um, they, they're very approachable. I, I emailed both of them uh, for the talk. That's how Jurgen showed up. They're both on Twitter. Um, check them out there. Uh, and in fact, they're also on YouTube where you can find a, a much more succinct version of this talk uh, uh, that, uh, that Michael did. Uh, I will post that right here. So he has a much better job of explaining this than I did. But Hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully you learned something. What do you all think? I think it sounds very ambitious. <laughs> the proof sounds like the hard part. Yeah, the, uh, the, the language re refinement type system. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, I definitely want to read this paper now, though, because um, I do, I am a mathematician, so I would, I'm, I'm very curious uh, as to how they've set this up for themselves. Um, so th uh, thank you for presenting this. It was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of this, some of the papers or some of the articles mentioned a lot of this, th they tend to pair with proof systems or SMT. So that's, yeah. this paper is more like use it by itself. Like whereas a lot of other, like you can do refinement types in some languages already, but this is like more automatic kind of stuff. Yeah, that's what's yeah. interesting about this is I, I don't think I've actually heard of a, a a, a real go at it in a while <laughs> so very interesting to see like what what they've come up with that makes them think this is possible because 
I, I, I mean, conceptually, I haven't read the paper. I'm, I'm ready to, I to hear this. This, this sounds very interesting. <laughs> no, right? Um, yeah. I, I should post the paper too. Let me, uh, let me post things to the paper as well. Just has, sure. out of curiosity, has anyone here written a context-free grammar before? Um, don't know if writing pack rep parser counts. I've wrote, I've written grammars before when I was doing, of all things, when I was working on a newspaper for replacing a classified ad parser, which is kind of fun because it wasn't <laughs> structured. I promise I don't remember if it, I think it counts. I'd have to check. It was using, yeah, basically the Ruby library for doing pack rep parsing, but I remember having to write a grammar for it because it was easier than, basically looking at the original code, the previous guy had written, it was like the whole giant, like if, if you know, the chain kind of, the parser kind of the sign that someone's basically just done with the parser by hand ac accidentally. Nice. I actually wrote an antler grammar this week. Uh, nice, nice thing between jobs is I actually get to dig into fun stuff like that. I don't think my grammar requires a context. I think I think it can read on its own. I don't think it requires. I don't think there's any context specific knowledge into it. So it might be context free. I wrote one once. I, I was doing a little bit of work with one at my old job to parse log files because we wrote mm -hmm. out these log files and we were pretty sure that they were parsable. <laughs> Turns out they weren't, by the way, but we didn't know that when we started. So that's, that's why you do it, right? <laughs> I mean, I've, I'm, I'm, consuming a bunch of strange government reports right now and i i need there's no consistent format there's no consistent structure it doesn't follow anything i have to do i have to like find the reports to explain what it is even at and there's so much overlap between people that should know better so i don't know it's uh, i mean there's there's a lot of so, so you're in the you're in the worst space. You're in the bad space. <laughs> I mean, this is for a research project, so like, yeah, it's it, <laughs> it gets real specialized real quick. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But I mean, so like, oh gosh, it would be like these kinds of things are very interesting to me because I've I have thought I've spent so much of my time lately thinking about like uh, standards and um, like how to transmit data and uh, appropriate structures for these kinds of things and the kind of like overarching structures that need to be in place for the dissemination of data. So, I mean, I don't know, this kind of stuff is interesting. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I think, I, I think it's really neat. I, 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 I agree with you, Lauren. It, it is ambitious. I think it's, 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 a, it's an extremely ambitious project. Yeah, well, it's very interesting. I just, I don't feel like I've uh, had anybody try to put forth something. So I feel like they must have discovered something, something novel. Did, um, while reading the paper, did anything like really stand out as like a new thought in the space? Well, uh, I, I mean, for me, it's, uh, it, it, it's just the idea of, of even, what was new for me uh, was the idea of, of even trying to do automatic inference. And I, the, the analogy of grammar to parsers as uh, functions or types or vice versa, um, I thought was really interesting. I was like, aha, well, that's a great, like that connection is very interesting. I never thought about it before. This reminds me a little bit of a research product I once saw at a Microsoft, um, which was, uh, it was, uh, so we all know that you can turn a program into an abstract syntax tree. And yeah. that's great. That's, that's very, like very common. And they were trying to go from an abstract syntax tree back to the original program so that you could wow. examine the abstract syntax tree and modify that and then get the like a program created from that abstract syntax tree that you could show to someone else. Um, Did it and work? I don't remember what the results were. I think it was like it was in progress research when I saw it. Um, they were like they were like giving like a presentation on it. I was when I was at Microsoft briefly. 
Um, but it was a cool idea, and they were like, you know, like we could abstract syntax trees are easier to do analysis on than code, so we could do some like basic code equivalents. You know, we could do some stuff, interesting stuff, if we could get do this properly. The problem is you can't necessarily get to the original program from the abstract syntax tree. Like it's not, you can have more than one program lead to the same abstract syntax tree. Right. And I think that's what the, that, that's the one part of this vision paper that I was like, I don't know if we'll get there is, is the bi-directional bit, like going mm -hmm. from the, the, uh, the grammar back to code. I was like, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> but maybe you know um i wrote um i wrote an xml uh parser once and c plus plus and the whole goal of it was to enable this kind of bi-directional thing uh, and so all of the elements came along with uh with tags as to where they started and be, uh, ended in the original text so that you could actually clip out an element from the original text and replace it without disturbing any of the rest of it. And you have to work and uh, that's really rad. Well, it's tricky stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is just a, a, an area of, of I want I want to call it programming language theory, right? Where yeah, that I think is really interesting. Yeah. Has anybody ever written a parser? Have you ever tried your own? Yeah. I mean, I've always been so curious. Uh, I wrote the grammar, which converted to a parser. Mm. Yes, yeah, so, same here. Yeah, I use the parser generator to generate a parser from a grammar, but mm -hmm. I don't think I hand wrote the parser myself. That seems like a pain. Depends well, on I, the... oh. I hand wrote the XML parser that I mentioned. You can do it for like smaller stuff. It's kind of been on my, you know, idle list for years to do to port uh, MK and RC. Our MK build system and RC shell to Rust, and that would be there. They pretty much use handwritten parsers because they're small enough. You don't really need to have. It's more work to have a parser generator than it is just to write the simple because it's simple like a simple, um, oh, like simple recursive descent parser. Yeah, I, I've written those too. Um, actually, I in my last my, one of my last job, we a lot of my job, a lot of our job was to parse these log files. We had to turn log mm -hmm. like files that we pulled logs from into like data which we'd store in a database to understand our system. A lot of reasons we. Should, there were better ways to do this, but this is what we did. Um, and uh, I, I wrote, a, I did a lot of work with parsers for it, actually. And I got really into programming. I got into language theory pretty hard while doing it. That's so cool. Uh, it, th th this reminds me a lot of uh, of Racket. You know, uh, like mm. the Racket language, like they have a lot of, what, one of the coolest things about Racket is how easy it is to make, um, uh, to quickly make domain specific languages uh, uh, in Racket. And, you know, this makes you think, oh, that's like uh, uh, a uh, cheap and easy parser. Really slow, but, you know, uh, an interesting language to play around with, you know. Oh, well, cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks I for like hanging out, everyone. I'm I'm clicking the uh, the racket page, and uh, their uh, their community is discourse and discord, and I'm just wondering if all the old IRC like all the old IRC things are just have slowly migrated over to discord. I'm pretty sure they have. There, there's there's a lot of. I mean, discord's so easy to spend. It's so easy to spend with discord, right? You know, um, it's all. It's also if you want to get the kids too, the youth. The youth. Scott, we're old. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks, Devin. Um, well, I'm going to, to stop recording. We can still uh, hang out and chat, um, but I'm going to stop recording. I want to thank everyone for coming out. Uh, thank you again for 
for being here at the beginning um, to, to wrap the paper. And we will see you next month at Paper 2 of Seattle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you.